As the Money Burns is an original podcast by Nikki Woodard. Based on historical research, this is a deep exploration into what happened to a set of actual heirs and heiresses to some of America's most famous fortunes when the Great Depression hits. Each episode has three primary sections. Section 1 is a narrative story. Section 2 goes deeper into the historical facts. Section 3 focuses on contemporary, emotional, and personal connections. Story Recap When Barbara Hutton and Prince Alexis Devani are caught in bed together, Louise Van Allen must decide what to do next. Now back to As the Money Burns. Fame Rumor Deceptions run high as another divorce is announced and a grand home reopens. Can't these people get their story straight already? Section 1. Story With so much love in the air, rumors flourish brightening the dreary lives of many facing the darkness of the Great Depression. The subject of such rumors comes with flights of fancy and a bit of schadenfreude. And of course, anything involving fortunes, especially those imploding ones. Then there are the rumors surrounding love. Many fantasize about falling in love, but so rarely do people want to think about the opposite, divorce. But rumors, oh, so love a divorce. Uh Uh-huh, rumors can be such silly little things. To have any weight or strength, they bear partial truths and partial falsehoods. Only time tells which parts are true. But nothing can keep a dame rumor from magnifying as it quickly sweeps far and wide. Sometimes it can be so hard to tell what is news and what is just a rumor. Tuesday, September 27, 1932, Genoa, Italy. Italian Premier Benito Mussolini participates in the celebrations for the maiden voyage of SX Rex, an Italian luxury ocean liner which intends to beat transatlantic speed records for passenger based travel. Boarding the ship, wealthy financier E.T. Ned Stotesbury and his wife Eva Stotesbury are on their way back to their palatial estate, White Marsh Hall, on the outskirts of Philadelphia. Back in June 1932, they had packed up the house and let go of a large majority of staff when the Stotesburys headed to Europe. They claimed to worry about potential looting, but all those fears seemed to be temporarily diminished. Could this return and reopening be due to Eva's son, James Jimmy, H.R. Cromwell's burgeoning romance with the much younger, richest girl in the world, Doris Duke, this summer in France? Jimmy and family trailed behind the heiress constantly, running into her from one spot to the next. The promising romance and potential engagement renews hope for the Stotesburys and Jimmy. Barely out to sea, the Rex encounters engine problems and docks at nearby Gibraltar for repairs. Stotesbury, Eva, and Jimmy, along with 1,200 more passengers, must wait to see when their voyage will continue. With so many needing to get back to life in the United States, the more urgent or possibly spooked 500 will quickly make other arrangements. One mustn't forget another ill-fated maiden voyage. Ahem, the Titanic? It takes three days to make the necessary repairs, then Rex resumes its maiden voyage. Speaking of Jimmy, his former World War I lover, supreme hostess, and coloratura soprano opera singer Cobina Wright makes her way back to the States. Last year, she launched a very successful and popular restaurant venture out of her Manhattan brownstone, the Sutton Club. The dinner club had a trail of celebrities and other famous personages, like World War I General Pershing, as guest and clientele. As the Sutton Club is seasonal, Cobina closed it and headed to Europe for the summer with intentions to reopen this fall, 1932. She, too, is hit with rumors back in July 1932 that she might not reopen her club at her home, but in a new location. Now, as late as September 1932, she can't wait to hurry back and reopen. Everyone needs and wants more entertainment and distraction. Tobina takes it all in stride as long as there are no rumors about her husband William A. Wright's legal troubles, or worse, is cheating. 
a day after the intended but thwarted date of the wreck's arrival in New York, a rumor breaks out. Wednesday, October 5th, 1932. The newspapers rush to announce another Divani divorce is in the works. The infamous clan of dispossessed Russian princes and princesses are also known as the Marine Divanis for making very high-profile and wealthy matches. Each sibling has their own set of charming and seductive traits, but alas, the Divani charm lasts as long as their partner's hefty bank account. When funds deplete, so do their interests. But just as sensational as their marriages are, their divorces will likely garner even more attention. So which one will it be now? Eldest Princess Nina Divani Uberich, she is married to a rich American Dutch lawyer who's good at handling all the marital paperwork. No, they still need to keep him around. Prince Sergei Divani is on his second marriage to songbird Mary McCormick after dumping his previous wife, Silver Screen Siren of the Silent Era, and Rudolph Valentino's almost widow, Pola Negri. It seems Pola's ability to foresee the future did not warn her of the Divani powers in emptying bank accounts. Mary is a little better, but too is a bit foolish. Prince David Divani is married to multi-hyphenate singer-dancer-actress Mae Murray. Last year in August 1931, the girl with the bee-stung lips was stinging from Prince David's overspending and rougher manners. After a public announcement of separation and potential divorce, they quickly made up a week later. They shared the only next-generation Divani progeny, a son, Karan Divani. Princess Rusadana Rusi Divani Sert is a sculptress married to famous and one of the best commissioned artists in the world, Joseph Maria Sert. Recent commissions have led to a very plush lifestyle filled with bohemian and other exotic enchantments. Lastly, the youngest, Prince Alexis Divani, marries his best friend's sister and a major society heiress, Louise Van Allen, after sponging off that family for nearly a decade. At last, Prince Alexis has recently been caught in bed with another uber-wealthy heiress, Barbara Hutton, at Rusi and Sert's estate in Palamo, Spain, though that remains a secret to most, for now. And the Divani heading to divorce court is none other than, drumroll please, Prince Sergei Divani. Ah, uh, his opera singer wife Mary seems to be losing her wits, especially after her special friend, Sam and Soul, was busted for a large industrial Ponzi scheme and has skipped the country. In Soul's vast wealth and protectively helpful guidance of Mary's funds was one of her biggest lures for the Divani clan. Could the couple's troubles be related to their recent implosion? But news indicates Sergei and David's oil venture in Venice, California is doing quite well and the brothers are enjoying their success. Oh well, easy come, easy go. Despite all the public protestations of love and friendship during their early courtship while Sergei and Pola divorced, now it seems this second marriage is not working out either. Sergei is reportedly living in a hotel while Mary is being consoled by friends and consulting with her lawyer, Michael Luddy. Wow, go figure. Only a day later, more news comes. Thursday, October 6, 1932, Los Angeles. The couple refute claims of a bust-up as ridiculous and are very much in love still 17 months into their marriage. The hotel is actually the home where they have both lived together for the last four months. The friend consoling Mary is none other than her husband, Sergei. The rumor went as far as London. Meanwhile, a voyage back to the United States has more unexpected diversions. Saturday, October 8, 1932, New York. Successfully crossing the Atlantic, the SSX Rex arrives in New York only three hours later than scheduled, but still within good promise of breaking future records. Many greeted in celebration after the delays. Only when the Rex docks, E.T. Stotesbury exits with his granddaughter and her husband. But many are surprised that Mrs. Ava Stotesbury is missing from the plank. She is always easily spotted with her elaborate fancy hats. And who can forget her quite extensive, specialty-made alligator luggage? Eva and her son Jimmy did not reboard the Rex in Gibraltar, but for other reasons. While waiting for repairs, word reached them to learn that her oldest son, Oliver Tony Cromwell, had to have an emergency operation. 
Jimmy took charge and booked a quick plane flight to France. It will be the first time Eva ever travels by plane. The mother and son fly to Paris and spend time with Tony, then will head back to the United States a few weeks after, once again via ocean liner. Coincidentally, also in Paris at the Ritz-Carlton, the new owner of the Newport Cottage Marble House, Frederick Prince, recently arrived via another ocean liner, the Majestic. He will be meeting with Mrs. Belmont, the former Alva Vanderbilt, to negotiate some of the final furnishings from her former summer residence. All is well for some, but troubles surmount for others. Friday, October 14th, 1932, Los Angeles. In other Divani news, May Murray appears in court and declares she's broke. She owes $725, that's 16.2 K, in 2023, to Marjorie Berger, an income tax expert. The girl with the bee stung lips was once worth several million, but now May claims to have no money and to be dependent upon her husband, Prince David Divani. Kind of ironic, as news indicates the brothers are successful in oil. So why can't David pay her bill? The same David who once declared on a speeding ticket his profession as a husband? Hmm, Divani's are good at spending others' money, as they never seem to have any of their own. When May and David married, Rudolph Valentino and Polo Negri served as best man and maid of honor. After Valentino's death, Polo befriended, married, then divorced Sergei. Polo, too, had once been financially well off until things changed. Sergei's constant overspending was extremely helpful in depleting, not rejuvenating, finances. David, too, interferes with several of May's entertainment contracts, resulting in diminishing funds. As the more flush Stotesbury resituates in the United States, he is not pleased and publicly dismisses rumors that he intends to sell his elaborate White Marsh Hall mansion. Stotesbury also proclaims his support for incumbent President Herbert Hoover. However, maybe Stotesbury would be happier if his stepson Jimmy, with his FDR leanings, stays abroad until after the upcoming election. Life goes on whether change occurs or not. But with many more changes ahead, the art of illusion becomes more difficult to maintain. Section 2 History and Historiography Within our story, it has been almost three years since the Wall Street crash on October 29, 1929, the day when sudden financial reversals occurred worldwide, and even those not immediately affected are eventually engulfed in one of the many domino-related occurrences afterwards. By three years, any cover-ups or diversions no longer work as problems compound. The Ponzi schemes like the Caldwell and Company in the American Midwest, Sweden's match king Ivor Kruger, and his vast array of international companies, and now this year, 1932, Sam Insel's energy empire are some of the larger instances, all finally exposed when the shuffling shell game of money collapses and can no longer hide the losses. More stories appearing around this time also remind us of the impact on individuals. One man distressed over the inability to pay his mortgage of 400, that would be almost 9,000 in 2023, fails at his jump into the Delaware River. Another, a former prominent auto man, J.E. Morehouse in Chicago, is found dead by suicide in his Chicago Loop Hotel room. On the dresser, six letters are found, one each to his wife, three friends, an undertaker, and lastly, to authorities, coroner, or what have you. Also on the dresser is 48 cents, all the money he had left. Today, that would be $10.27. The final note explains the why. He is another victim of the Depression. Everyone knows something is going wrong. President Hoover and others commonly use the phrase Great Depression, the term in small caps without a definite article, the. It will be in 1934 when British economist Lionel Robbins writes about the early 1930s economic meltdown and publishes a book titled The Great Depression. After that, Definite article, the, and capitalizations of G and D will become popular and eventually the standard when referring to this period. 
On occasion, other news report about troubles unrelated to the Great Depression, but will take longer to recover due to the latter. Things like an earthquake in Greece wipes out the homes of 20,000 families on October 10, 1932. Immediate reports claim 300 deaths, with many more unknown and likely buried in the ruins. Despite all the ongoing gloom in 1932, still surprisingly, hope seems to be returning. In Europe, there is a race to build and dominate the future international ocean travel. Speculations that a positive financial reversal will soon bring a return to better times. France and Italy are rivaling efforts to build the next state-of-the-art luxury with speedy technological advancement on a grander scale. The SS Rex previously launches on August 1, 1931, but is later updated to compete for the Blue Ribbon, a transatlantic competition for the fastest crossing of a passenger ship discussed in a previous episode. In recent years, Norddeutscher Lloyd, or North German Lloyd, has won the accolade with its ships Bremen and Europa. Italian ships Rex and Conte di Savoia are dubbed the Riviera afloat, with amenities including some sand in the pools. Each are modified to make for transatlantic trips in hopes of securing the blue ribbon for Italy. The Rex is decorated in the Art Deco style, also known then as the Liner style, referring to another popular French ship, Ile de France. Other elements of the Italian liner are similar to the British Aquitania and Olympic. The latter is a sister ship of the Titanic. Recent publicity for the Rex is setting it up to rival the Majestic. All these other mentioned ships have been covered in other previous episodes. For the 1932 ceremony, Il Duce, Italian Premier Benito Mussolini, proudly launches the upgraded SS Rex for its maiden voyage from Genoa to New York. Only the ship had barely left port when problems occurred. It docked in Gibraltar for three days of repairs before continuing its journey. The Rex then resumed making the transatlantic trip, arriving only three hours after its scheduled time and close to the desirable goal of six and a half days. The actual Atlantic crossing was to be four and a half days. Due to the delays, half the passengers booked alternate passages not secure that the Rex would be functioning in decent time or make the passage safely. One of those travelers is former New York mayor, James Jimmy Walker. He jumped to the mainland and booked another passage on the rival German Europa. Walker is concerned about making it back in time for the next mayoral race. Only Walker arrived on the Europa 48 hours after the Rex made it to New York. The Rex then stays docked in New York for more lengthy repairs before leaving on October 26, 1932. The Rex makes the return trip from New York to Genoa in six and a half days. In August 1933, Rex will win the Blue Ribbon with a time of four days and 13 hours, a record that will last for two years until the French ship Normandy breaks it in 1935. During World War II, both Rex and Conte de Savoia will continue transporting their passengers. However, by spring 1940, passages are stopped for safekeeping. Rex is docked at Genoa until the city is bombed, then moved to Trieste. On September 8, 1944, the Rex is bombed by the British RAF. Afterwards, the Rex was listing, tilting to one side, and on fire after 59 rockets and numerous cannonballs hit it. A second attack occurs later that same day. The Rex turns over, burns for four days, and eventually sinks in the shallow water. In 1950, Rex will be broken up in situ, meaning breaking apart for parts. We must always learn to keep rebuilding despite whatever has passed, whether good or bad. Hope abounds for a better future. But first, a little more passage through darkness, and a hint that even with moments of brightness, other dark times will soon follow. As such is the cycle of life, hope, disappointment, success, and end, then rebirth, as it all happens again. Section 3, Contemporary and Personal Relevance What is a rumor, and what is real? Amazing how that question seems to never go away. 
Of course, there is a saying, wherever there is a rumor, there seems to be a truth behind it. Many warn we can never know what is really happening behind closed doors, though it never fails that once there is a hint of another possibility, speculation inevitably follows. Divorce is a many splendor thing. Just the hint of divorce in the air can instigate rumors and speculation. Any celebrity marriage will be overly dissected by the public, and that is even more so when the couple like to overly profess and publicly display their grand romance, fantastic connection, or worse, perfect compatibility. No surprise then when those relationships show signs of trouble, extra tension brings more probing. There are plenty of relationships plagued with rumors of dissolution long before they happen. And there are several others that appear perfect up until the end. And then the nastiness comes out. When someone makes it their business to be so public about their lives, they shouldn't be too surprised when rumors and criticism comes with it. Yet again, one of the prime examples of this is Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Lessons can be gleaned from the dignified, conscious uncoupling of Gwyneth Paltrow and Coldplay's Chris Martin to the never-ending battle between Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, which took seven years. And now the more recent final divorce settlement between Halle Berry and Olivier Martinez eight years later. Others include those with reality shows and Instagram accounts. And it seems every month, and especially now that we are embarking on the holiday season, there will be multiple announcements of celebrity marriages imploding. Joe Jonas and Sophie Turner's divorce looks potentially very dirty. Now, 18 months after the slap heard around the world, New information is coming out about Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith from Jada herself. When glamour, money, and celebrity get together then implode, there will always be a hunger for more information. Our young heirs and heiresses should heed the warning. With their large bank accounts, everyone is watching. Can you believe it? This is the 96th episode of As the Money Burns, which means we are just four episodes away from 100. Let me know if you have any questions you would like me to answer by reaching out to any of the social media accounts, As the Money Burns at Instagram, Facebook, and X, formerly Twitter. The holiday season is upon us, first with Halloween, then Thanksgiving, Christmas, and ending with Valentine's Day. If you are interested in having some fun apparel and items for either gifts or just to perk yourself up, check out Monster Gal Designs Lab at Etsy. This crazy lab is constantly making new creations with fun monster themes. Links in the notes and transcript. That's Monster Gal Designs Lab on Etsy. If you enjoy As the Money Burns, then please share, like, and subscribe. Next, when we return to As the Money Burns, one couple deals with more betrayal when litigation publicly reveals financial secrets. Until then, As the Money Burns is an original podcast written, produced, and voiced by Nikki Wooder based on historical research. Archival music has been provided by Past Perfect Vintage Music. Check out their website at www.pastperfect.com. Please come visit us at As The Money Burns via Good Pods, X, formerly Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Transcripts, timeline, episode guide, and character bios are available at asthemoneyburns.com. <laughs>